Hello, thank you for joining us today for our Sunday School Lesson Study. My name is Napoleon McClinton. Let us begin with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for another day that you have made. We thank you, Father, for allowing us to be a part of this day and for watching over us and keeping us safe as we slumbered and as we slept last night. We thank you, Father, for getting us up this morning and for giving us a heart and a mind to praise and to glorify you as we study your holy word. We pray, Father, for this church, the Greater Shallow Missionary Baptist Church. We pray for every member. We pray for every leader. We pray, Father, for all those that you have put in positions of stewardship. We pray that we would be the kind of church that you have called us to be, and that is a Christ-centered church where others would come to know you through your darling son, Jesus. We thank you, Father, for this neighborhood, for this community, for this city, for this county, for this state, as well as for this great nation in which we live. We pray that you will continue to guide and direct us and keep us safe in your care. We pray, Father, that you would bless those and protect those that are sick, those that are afflicted, those that are suffering from the loss of some loved ones, those that are dealing with the many issues surrounding the economic slowdown, the global pandemic, as well as the worldwide catastrophic failures and, and disasters in which we see. We pray that you would comfort each and every one and that you would have them know, Father, that no matter what the circumstances might be, that you promised in your word that you would never leave us, nor will you ever forsake us. We thank you, Father, for your darling son, Jesus. We thank you for his life, for his death, for his burial, and for his resurrection, and for his ascension back into heaven. We pray, Father, that you continue to bless each and every person, Father, and keep us safe. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Again, I want to say thank you for joining us for our Sunday School lesson study for today. We are studying continually in the uh, quarterly topic, which is entitled Celebrating God. Uh, we are looking at Unit 3 series of lessons, and our lessons are entitled Visions of Praise. And so our lesson study for today is the November 14th. 2021 lesson, and it's lesson 11, and it's entitled God of Power. As we look in the book of Revelation, begin and at chapter 11, verses 15 through 19 of the New International Version of the Bible. Our agenda is on the screen, and so our agenda for today is entitled, uh, we have three teaching agendas, agenda. And the first one is entitled Declaration of Truth, as we look at Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. Our second outline is entitled Worship of God, as we look at Revelation chapter 11, verse 16 through 18. And our third outline is Opening of Temple, from Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. All scripture will come from the New International Version of the Bible. And so our scripture is on the screen for today, and it is entitled uh, The Seventh Trumpet from the book of Revelation, chapter 11, verse 15 through 19. And let's read our scripture for today, beginning at verse 15, and it reads as follows. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power 
and have began or begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your people who revere your name, both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple we seen the ark of his covenant, and, it, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumbling, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a severe hailstone. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. And so next on our screen, we'll see our lesson context. Again, this is the November 14th, 2021, Lesson 11 study, which is entitled God of Power. And we've been reading from the New International Version of the Bible in Book of Revelations, Chapter 11, Verses 15 through 19 of the New International Version. And so let's read our context together. The book of Revelation has been traditionally understood to have been received by the churches in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, during the last decade of the first century A.D., this likely dates its reception during the reign of the Roman Emperor Domitian, who reigned from 81 to 96 AD. It is widely accepted that one of Domitian's predecessors, Nero, reigned from AD 54 to 68, instituted vast persecutions of Christians across the Roman Empire. The audience of the Apostle John, author of the book of Revelations, would have been familiar with such persecution. The key to understanding the book of Revelation lies in recognizing the type of literature it is, known as apocalyptic. This type of writing can be found in other parts of the scripture, such as in Isaiah chapter 13, verse 10, chapter 34, verse 4, Daniel chapter 8, verse 9 through 10, Matthew chapter 24, verse 28 through, I'm sorry, verse 29 through 31, Mark chapter 13, verse 24 through 27, and Luke chapter 21, verse 25 through 28. Apocalyptic literature features unveiling of a big picture reality by a heavenly being, usually God or angels, to a human recipient. The reality that is revealed includes elements of both time, dealing with the end time of salvation and judgment, and space, the reality of another supernatural world. In some instances, apocalyptic literature repeats a story several times with different details, but the same ending. For example, the imagery of seals, trumpets, and bowls in Revelations depicts God's righteous judgment on rebellious and sinful humanity. The final act in each series is accompanied by extraordinary weather phenomena that cultivated that cultivate in the worship of God for his righteous acts. The central part of the book of Revelation concerns three set of seven events initiated in heaven. The opening of seven seals in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 through 17, as well as chapter 8, verse 1 through 5. The sounding of seven trumpets, in Revelations chapter 8, verse 6 through 9, and the pouring out of several, seven vials of judgment in Revelations chapter 16, verse 1 through 21. The results on earth are cataclysmic. Each set of events ends with a time of worship and adoration. 
Today's lessons detail the climax of the sounding of the seventh trumpet. The immediate context for today's passage is that seven angels who were ready to sound seven trumpets in Revelation chapter 8, verse 6. The results of the first four of these seven soundings find parallels with the ten plagues poured out on Egypt in Exodus chapter 7, verse 14 through chapter 11, verse 10. The first signal, a bloody, fiery hailstone that destroys one-third of the earth in Revelation chapter 8, verse 7. The second leads to something like the appearance of a burning mountain being hurled into the sea. The sea turns to blood. Sea creatures are killed. Ships are destroyed in Revelation chapter 8, verses 8 through 9. The third calls for a fiery star from the heavens that pollutes many of the freshwater rivers and brings death. Revelations chapter 8, verse 10 through 11. The four strikes part of parts of earth of the great lights. I'm sorry, the four strikes parts of each of the great lights, the sun, moon, and stars in Revelations chapter 8, verse 12. The fifth signals the opening of the abyss, unleashing a horde of locusts on mankind in the process in Revelations chapter 9, verse 1 through 5. The sixth releases four mighty angels and their armies to kill one-third of sinful humanity in Revelations chapter 9, verse 13 through 16. These judgments, however intense, fail to stop the idolatry and sexual immorality in the world from Revelation chapter 9, verse 20 and 21. Today's lesson focused on the seventh and final angel. And now on the screen, you'll see next a document that we presented last year, week or a chart uh, which we will look at as we uh, see that on the screen. Last week, we were studying from chapter 7, and we were looking at the great multitude of tribulation saints that were praising and glorifying God in heaven. Today, we move down to uh, Revelation chapter 11. And in chapter 11, we see the two tribulation witnesses the 42 months or 1260 days, and the third woe, as well as the seventh trumpet, is where our lesson will begin today. And so let's begin our lesson discussion as we look at our first outline, which has to do with the declaration of truth from Revelation chapter 11, verse 15 through 19 of the New International Version of the Bible. And our first outline uh, has to do with the seventh angel in verse 15a. And it reads as follows. And let's read verse 15a together. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet. Now the number of seven in, seven in this verse occurs hundreds of times in the Bible and it often signals completeness or perfection, as in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, when God on the seventh day, God rested from his work of creation. Also, we see the number seven mentioned mention in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 10, as well as Revelation chapter 15, verse 1 and verse 8. Now, the trumpets that are blown at accession are normally uh, at the accession or the ascension of kings to their thrones in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 34 through 41. And so we see these two concepts together. The seventh, uh, which normally has to do with completion or per uh, perfection, as well as trumpets, which has to do with the sounding uh, 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 that are typically blown uh, when a king uh, ascends to a throne, or when there are such things as being summons or called to war 
or as well as when there's such things as uh, calling for an assembly. And so now we see here that these two concepts are combined in verse uh, 15b. And so let's read verse 15b together. And it has to do with the loud voices. And let's read that. And there were loud voices in heaven which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Now, accompanying the sound of the seventh trumpet were loud voices in heaven. And these loud voices are typically in the book of Revelation characterized worship, as we see in Revelation chapter 5, verse 12, as well as Revelation chapter 7, verse 10. What John saw, though, speaks to the hope that the people of God have so long to see, and that was God had become the king over the whole world. The Old Testament prophets had looked for, forward to a day when the God of heaven would set up his kingdom that will never be destroyed, and it will endure forever. In Daniel chapter 22, I'm sorry, in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, and I read it as quoted. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end but it will itself endure forever. And also in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9, it reads, The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord and his name, the only name. Also in Revelation chapter 22, verse 14 and 15, we see, and it reads that this, revealed that this kingdom that is being talked about uh, as the unified city of the new Jerusalem. Those who continue to sin are not allowed to enter this new Jerusalem or this new uh, in God's kingdom. Now the loud voices in heaven proclaim that God will reign forever and forever. The kingdom of the world, which is temporary and filled with sin, However, the reign of God will be eternal, featuring everlasting life to those who have washed their robe in the blood of the Lamb. God's eternal reign is shared with the Lord Messiah, with his Messiah or his Christ, or as we know, with Jesus. These are Hebrew or Greek words that mean the same thing. The word uh, Messiah and the word Christ really means the same thing, and it means God's anointed one or the anointed one. And this anointed one, which is Jesus, uh, will reign forever and forever. And so we see now in our second outline how these 24 elders uh, that were there sitting around the throne of God. As a matter of fact, they were sitting in their own thrones and they had golden crowns on their head. So we see the position of these elders in verse 16 and the worship relationship of God from Revelations chapter 11, verse 16 through 18. And so let's read verse 16 together. And the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before God, fell on their faces and worshiped God. And so these 24 elders were seated on their thrones uh, before God, and they had themselves golden crowns. But they fell down on their faces, and they began to worship God. So the sounding of the trumpet also signals the beginning of the worship and praise service uh, of God, as we see the outline here in Revelation chapter 11, verse 16 through 18. And so our next uh, outline, which is recognition of power, explains why they are worshiping, why they are bowing down. And let's read verse 17 together. Saying, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, 
the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And so we see in verse 17a that these 24 elders that were seated around the throne, we see that they fall into a position or a posture of worshiping as well as a posture of submission. They begin with thanks by addressing God using the respectful and the reverential title, Lord God Almighty. Now the phrase Lord here can imply a measure of respect as in uh, Matthew Gospel chapter 13 verse 27 as well as Matthew Gospel chapter 27 verse 63 where we see the word Lord being related to the word sir. And so Lord here combined with God Almighty is found in the New Testament only in Revelations chapter 4 verse 8, Revelations chapter 11 verse 17, which is our study for today, Revelations chapter 15 verse 3, Revelations chapter 16 verse 7, Revelations chapter 19, verse 6, as well as Revelations chapter 21, verse 22. So the phrase, Lord God Almighty, relays the expansive power of God in the world. The ancient Greek version of the Old Testament is the source of the phrase, Lord God Almighty, which is used 10 times in the book of Amos. God alone is almighty. In other words, God alone is the only one that has all power, for he is omnipotent. And so we see that God's redemptive plan will come to fruition as God has promised, even in the midst of tribulation as well as in the midst of suffering. Now in verse 17b, we see that the 24 elders here describes God's eternal nature when they use the phrase, the one who is and who was. This same phrase is used also in Revelations chapter 14, I'm sorry, Revelations chapter 1 verse 4, as well as Revelations chapter 1 verse 8, and Revelations chapter 4 verse 8. And it, ref and it reflects that God set the designation of himself as the great I am, in the book of Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, when God told Moses to tell the people, when Moses wanted to know, who shall I tell them sent me? He said, tell them I am. We also see this in John chapter 8, verse 58, when Jesus told the uh, Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees there that were contesting him as to who he was, he told them that before Abraham, I am. So he is the great I am, the one that self-revealed himself both in the book of Exodus as well as the one in the book of John. And so we see in verse 17b that uh, it speaks about God's eternal, unchanging nature, implying God's sovereignty. sovereignty. He is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants to do whenever he gets ready to do it with whomever he wants to. And so we see in verse 17c now that God's plan is shown in its totality and fullness as his overthrow of evil results in the uncontested reign. In other words, when God gets ready to dethrone or overthrow all the evil uh, persons in the world, it's not going to be a contest. It's going to be completely uncontested because God, one, is all-powerful and because God, two, is sovereign. And so we see in verse 17c that uh, as we have looked at God's total and fullness as he overthrow evil results in a uncontested reign. God, by his action, has answered the old age-old question, and that age of question is, how long, sovereign Lord? Which we read in Revelations chapter 6, verse 10, as well as Isaiah chapter 6, verse 11, and Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2. And so this part of John's heavenly prophetic vision will be the final move of God as he established a new heaven and a new earth 
from Revelations chapter 21, as well as Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17. And Peter also talks about that in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. And so we see the results now as they recognize God's uh, total power, as they recognize God's sovereignty. We look at that in uh, our next outline, which is the message of judgment from verse 18. And so let's read verse 18 together. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophet, and your people who revere your name, both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. And so we see in verse 18 that the 24 elders describes God's reactions to God, uh, describe the reactions to God's exercising his great power. And what he says is that the nations were angry. Their anger is a result of having to face God's ultimate wrath or God's ultimate judgment, as in Revelation chapter 6, verse 15 through 17. In other words, when God told Pharaoh to let my people go and Pharaoh refused and disobeyed God, ultimately Pharaoh had to face the wrath of God. And even then, it angered him even more after he had permitted to uh, release them until ultimately his entire army had to be drowned in the Red Sea. And so here God's wrath was poured out on them that does not recognize and repent. In other words, when they recognize God's power, they refuse to repent, which is what happened to Pharaoh. And consequently, Pharaoh had to deal with the wrath of God. And so the great day of the Lord, which was prophesied in Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 14, and had been long prophesied, is also now at hand, as we see uh, in verse, uh, uh, as we saw in verse 18a. And so we look in verse 18b, and the elders continue to, 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 to praise God because the time of judging the dead. It's when all those who have lived and died throughout history will be resurrected to face the judgment, as Daniel points out in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. And let's read what Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 says, and I'll read it for you. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting content. John also reveals in Revelation chapter 20, verse 12 through 13, and let me read this, what he saw in his vision. In verse 12, it begins, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. The books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. The de and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Uh, and so we're going to all have to stand before the judgment of God one day. And the book's going to be open. The good thing that's going to happen to those that accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they're going to be pardoned. They going they have their sins have been forgiven because they put their faith and their trust in the Lamb that was slain on the cross, and therefore God has washed away all their sins. And though they face the judgment, their the, the judgment uh, uh, verdict is going to be not guilty. And so we see now in the, as we look at we saw verse thirteen that the sea gave up uh, the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. And what we have done is that we put our trust and we put our faith in Jesus, which is the Messiah, which is God's anointed one, which is the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. And so we see now in verse 18c, 
that the reward to be given to the righteous also finds expressions in Matthew chapter 5, verse 12. Jesus points out that great will be the reward of those that endure persecution. Uh, and we see also point that pointed out in Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, as well as Paul writes about the reward that is laid up for him in, and all of those that believe in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 through 15, as well as John points that out for us in 2 John chapter 8. And in Revelations chapter 22, verse 12, and I quote what it says, Jesus promised uh, that he's coming. And so let me just read Revelations chapter 22, verse 12 for you here. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. And elsewhere, you also find that uh, the promise of God. God's servants, the prophets, which is mentioned in Revelations chapter 10, verse 7, are to be rewarded. Those are the servants of God who spoke about the future, as well as those servants who preach the message of God, which is the gospel. We see that in Psalms chapter 40, verse 9, in Acts chapter 8, verse 5, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16 through 18, as well as throughout other passages of Scripture in the New Testament. The one proclaiming God's truth calls people to a faithful relationship with the Lord in forsaking all other gods and remaining loyal to God alone, as Paul points out in Galatians chapter 4, verse 8. Another group that will be rewarded are the people of God who revere God's name, who were also faithful, and in the New Testament they're also called saints. They're drawing attention to the holiness of the body of Christ, which is the church. So the church will be those that have forsaken uh, idol gods and turned to Christ and been faithful until the end. And God called them, uh, and mostly they are, they are God's people. They are followers of God's son, Jesus Christ. And that draws attention to the church, which is the body of Christ and the holiness that's part of the church. These include both great and small. It doesn't matter what statue they are or what their political position is or what their power structure is. All of those that have will stand before God, both great and small. And those that have been faithful until the end will be pronounced uh, as, as fulfillment of God's promise that God will provide for them that a place that they will be with him and will dwell with him forever. And so we see now that it includes both great and small. All the faithful to God, and they will be rewarded uh, as promised in Revelations chapter 19, verse 5. Now we see in verse 18c that the 24 elders now describes God's visiting on those who destroy the earth. And that reveals all those evil entities that have existed uh, and lived throughout history. In other words, God's going to deal with all of those evil people and persons that have failed to acknowledge God through his son, Jesus. And ultimately, they're going to have to face the wrath of God, and they're going to have to deal with the judgment. And so then the fulfillment of God's kingdom will bring eternal retribution to those who, propose, who oppose the power and purpose of God. Paul writes about this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 6 uh, through 9. And let me just read uh, verse 6 through 9. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. And so now Paul turns, uh, uh, John turns his attention to a sight he saw in the temple. As we look at our next outline, which has to do 
opening the temple. And we're talking about the heavenly temple. As we know, the uh, earthly temple was destroyed in A.D. 70. And so, the, and, and, and so now we're looking at uh, John has give, been given visions uh, in heaven of what the heavenly temple would look like. And so let's read uh, verse 11, I mean, chapter 11, verse 19, which is on the screen. And that has to deal with what's inside the temple, the content. Let's read this. Then God's temple in heaven was open, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. Now, God's temple in heaven is the large sanctuary of God in heaven uh, and the center of worship, as pointed out in Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, as well as chapter 7, verse 15, as well as Revelation chapter 15, verse 5 through 8, and Revelation chapter 21, verse 22. We saw as we looked at verse uh, 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 as we looked at Revelation chapter seven, all those that were standing around the throne of God and the Lamb were dressed in white, which symbolizes that they had been saved or cleansed from their sins. And so that would be the center of worship there in the in heaven, the the, the sanctuary of God, the dwelling place of God. And so we see here that when this temple is open, John see into the innermost parts of the heavenly temple, and he saw the greatest treasure of all in the temple that was God's Ark of his covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was symbolic in the Old Testament of God's very presence with his people as they traveled from place to place in the 40 years of wilderness wandering as also as when the temple was built by Solomon, it was a place where God said he would put his name on it, where he would dwell with his people. Now, that temple was destroyed by the Romans in A.D. 70, as well as we know that the Ark of the Covenant was not there because it was a symbolic representation of God's dwelling among his people. But we see now in the, John's vision of the heavenly sanctuary and the opening of the temple, that we see that there is an Ark of the Covenant there. The Ark in heaven, though, fulfills its ultimate purpose, and that purpose will that God will rule his people, and his presence will be with them permanently or forever, as pointed out in Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. Now, another phenomenon occurs there that has to do with the weather, and let's read that in verse 19b. And there came flashes of lightning, rumbling, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a severe hailstone. The opening of the temple is accompanied by these flashes of lightning, by these rumblings of, and peals of thunder, as well as an earthquake and severe uh, hailstone, uh, hailstones. In Revelation chapter 8, verse 5, as well as Revelation chapter 4, verse 5. Such imagery that we see here of this great uh, phenomenon with the weather is intended to catch the reader's attention, perhaps to show the seriousness of God's judgment. A severe hailstorm is often associated with such judgment, as we saw a uh, read in Exodus chapter 9, verse 22 through 27, in Job chapter 28, verse 20 through, uh, 22 through 23, in Psalms chapter uh, number 78, verse 48, as well as in the book of Isaiah, chapter 28, verse 17, as well as in Haggai, chapter 2, verse 17, as well as in the book of Revelation, chapter 8, verse 7. And so this imagery of uh, the uh, lightning flashes, the lightning, the rumbling, the peals of thunder, an earthquake and a severe uh, uh, and a severe uh, hailstone. All of that was would also draw the audience to compare John's vision with God's re uh, revelation to Moses in Exodus chapter 19, verse 16 through 19, where Moses there on the Mount Sinai, when God appeared to his people uh, as God they came out of Egypt and. Uh, of 430 years of slavery, 
they met their God there on Mount Sinai. And when they met God, the mountain quaked. Uh, there were flashes of lightning. And all of this is imagery to demonstrate God's great power and God's great control of all of the elements. Even in heaven, God still has control of all of those elements. And so we see that, 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 that phenomenon of the weather uh, as, John, as it appear in John's uh, vision in Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, is a demonstration of God's great power and God's great control of all of the fierce elements of the weather. And so then we compare that this God who had revealed himself to Moses there at Mount Sinai will also one day reveal himself to all people as the judge and the one worthy of all worship. And so we look at our conclusion for today, uh, and let's read our conclusion, which is on the screen. It has to do with eternal worship. Isaiah, I'm sorry, Israel's center of worship, the temple, had been destroyed about 25 years in A.D. 70 before John wrote the book of Revelation. But some 40 years before John wrote Revelation, the Jerusalem temple importance had been superseded by Jesus' death and resurrection in A.D. 30, as pointed out in Matthew chapter 27, verse 5 through 11, and Hebrew chapter 8, verse 1 through chapter 10, verse 22. And so that resulted in a new understanding of what the temple really was now, since there is no temple there in Jerusalem. Paul points out that our body is the temple of the Lord, that is, if the Holy Spirit dress, uh, dwell there. And so we see Paul address this, this, this temple of our body as we look in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 through 17, as well as 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 through 19, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, and in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 21. John's vision saw an ever better re reality to come, that of God's heavenly temple where worship continues into eternity. For the original audience that had experienced persecution, perhaps even being unable to worship communi communally, how encouraging this common reality must have been. Today's scripture invites us to anticipate a future where the kingdom of God is fully established everywhere, where injustice no longer prevails, and where we worship God for eternity. What a beautiful sight where injustice no longer prevails. For we know now that we are in injustice situation as we've been dealing with all even racial, social, economic, all kind of injustice exists down here on this earth. And so one day when we go to be with the Lord, we won't have to deal with all of that. And so we see here in Matthew chapter 24, verse 44, Jesus tells his disciples uh, concerning the end time and how what they must do. He says, so you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. And what we can do, since we do not expect him, we can start to be getting ready now through putting our trust and our faith in his son, Jesus. So when he does come, we will be ready and we will be waiting. And so let's close with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that through John's visions in the book of Revelation, we can get a glimpse of what our future will be. For as you have promised, you are coming one day. And we just want to be ready for your coming. So help us, Father, to hold on through to our faith in Jesus Christ. And not just to hold on it, to it internally in our own hearts and minds, but to share it as we go from place to place with others, that others may come to know you through your darling son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection. And, Father, as he became the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. 
In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. May God continue to bless you and keep you is my prayer. And thank you for listening. to tell.